Father, I thank you and I praise you. Lord, speak to your precious people this morning. Lord, we lean upon your understanding. We lean upon you, Holy Spirit. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through this pulpit, that you would speak, Lord, through, through me as a tool used for you. Lord, there is nothing good within me but only your Holy Spirit. And so let not your spirit depart from me, Lord. Lord, you can take all things, but let not your spirit depart. Those are the words of King David. And Lord, we must all hold true to those words that David once spoke. Lord, without you, we have nothing and we are nothing. But Lord, today is a good day because this is the day you have made. We shall rejoice and Lord, as this message goes forth, Lord, may it touch the hearts, resulting in salvation. The prodigal's coming home. Lord, your will be done. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The message today is entitled, Is It Really About Figs? That's right, I said it. Figs. F-I-G-S. Who loves to eat figs? We have one. Yep. Yeah. My grandmother, um, I remember, early memory, she had a rent house in Lockhart, Texas. And in back of that rent house, there was a tree with about a million figs. And she would always tell me, go eat, eat one, go get one. And I did not like the taste of figs, especially as a little kid. Who liked the taste of fruit? I, I didn't. And so uh, I didn't want to be rude and tell her no, but I would just get them and I would chunk them, <laughs> you know. I'd just act like I was, you know, she'd see me grabbing it and when she turned away, I'd just chunk it. I didn't want to eat figs, but uh, um, to, uh, I guess I haven't changed because uh, I don't have any figs in my refrigerator or I uh, haven't bought any in years. I don't think I've ever bought figs. I, I know Anna has, but, uh, but anyways, it is not about figs, but we can learn from figs and that is what we're going to do today in john chapter 5 uh, 15 verse 5 excuse me jesus says i am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing this is jesus christ speaking to the believer now the lord was not talking about fruit that we eat he was going very deep jesus was saying in this passage that he's the life that in him is all life the, the the sustaining of life is in jesus all your needs that can be met are in jesus and he is saying you must bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing without me says jesus you have no life Without Jesus, you have no wisdom, no direction. Without Jesus, you know, without uh, seeking the guidance of Jesus, His Holy Spirit, we have nothing. But in that scripture, it says we are to bear much fruit if we abide in Him. Abide means you stay, you remain in Christ. So therefore, we can walk away from Jesus. We can not be in Jesus we can deceive ourselves the devil is very tricky he knows every plan and scheme there is known on the face of this earth but it's very easy to figure out the wiles of the devil because he doesn't do anything new he always does the same thing over and over and over and we should learn from our failures we should also learn from our victories but we cannot live off of our failures or victories. But Jesus is saying very clear here, if we stay in him, we will have much evidence. That's really what fruit is. It's evidence. The fruit in Jesus is talking about is evidence. Evidence that your character has changed. Evidence that you're not who you used to be, but you're a new creation in Christ. Evidence that you're now doing things for the kingdom of God where before you were a Christian, you served yourself and really you served the kingdom of Satan. You were contributing to wickedness. You were contributing to, to things that have no eternal value in the kingdom of God. And so when you became a Christian, 
you were called now to bear fruit, meaning to give evidence of your relationship with Christ, of your relationship with the church of Christ, and that you're on your way to heaven. There's a change. There's a change. And Jesus says, you're called to bear fruit, but you can do nothing apart from me, says Jesus. Now in Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 14, we see that Jesus, now the next day it says, when they had come out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Jesus cursed this tree. Jesus looked at this fig tree, and Jesus was going to this tree because he knew, because he created this tree. So Jesus knows what this tree could do. He was expecting fruit from this tree. He was hungry. The things that Christ creates are for a purpose. And you are greater than that fig tree. You are his most cherished creation. And so if he can look at a tree and know that he designed this tree, he created this tree, he put this tree right in the ground for just a time as this, that when Jesus would walk, on the face of the earth at this right moment precise second that jesus would be hungry and he would expect to pull a fig from this tree and when the tree could bear no fruit jesus said let no one eat from you ever again how much more his creation you are perfect in the way god created you you have all that you need and god created you for such a time as this And one day the Lord will come to you as well. And he will want to use you for such a time as this, for his glory, to to meet the needs of others as this tree was supposed to meet the need for Jesus in his physical hunger. And And only the Lord can say, I'm done with you. You know what? This is it. Your time is up. I'm kind of paraphrasing this, you know, reading in between the lines. Only the Lord can say, your life is over. Amen? The Bible says that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Look, look, look what 2 Timothy 4.2 says. It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Rebuke means You need to stand up for what's right in this world. And there are times as a Christian, you're going to speak against wickedness and evil. Exhort means to what? Encourage. That's what exhort means. You must encourage. If you are discouraging to the body of Christ, the people, you are doing disservice to Jesus. You're not bearing fruit. And you must convince. How do you convince people about the the, the glory of God, about the cross of Jesus? It's not by pounding him in the head with the Bible. It's by living a life of holiness and godliness. That is how you convince somebody that God is real. By the way you live your life. Amen. With all long suffering and teaching, meaning you must have patience with people. And you must be a teacher. Now, not all are going to teach in the form that I'm doing this morning. But as a Christian, we are all teachers. We all show the way. Now, the word said, be prepared in season and out of season. Amen? But the scripture we just read in Mark 11, in verse um, 12, it says here, we can go back up to that scripture, please. It says, He found nothing but leaves, for it was not season for figs. But the word of God says, be prepared in season and out of season. This fig tree used the excuse Well, it's not time for me yet. Watch me. Follow me closely. The tree said, it's not season for me. Granted, the word has given us an indication. It was not season for this fig tree to give figs, to give fruit. But the word of God says, be prepared in season and out of season. And so we as Christians are called to be ready at all times to serve God. Or you will use the excuse that the fig tree used. Well, it's just not my time yet. Well, I got to do this in life. I got to take care of these issues first. Don't be that fig tree that is not in season. Now, is it really about figs? 
Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. Jesus spoke a parable. He says in verse 6, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. What did we read in our opening scripture in John 15, 5? Jesus says, I am divine. You are the branches. Jesus is speaking clearly, clearly excuse me, about his relationship with the Father. Jesus is the one who came and interceded for us. He intercedes for us today. Jesus is the one who comes into the vineyard of God. And Jesus is the vine that brings life. And Jesus is the one who said to the Father, Look, let me go down. Let me show them. Let me reveal to them our love for all of humanity. Give me a little more time. And why does it say three years? Look, biblically, it takes three years to prepare an individual to really walk and serve Christ. How long did the disciples serve Jesus, walk with Jesus? A little over three years. How long did the Apostle Paul go into training before he was ever revealed into ministry? Three years. That's a biblical number about three. If you're going to be prepared for ministry, for full-fledged leadership ministry, you need to serve under someone, a leader in the church for around three years. That's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. But the Lord is saying, the, 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 the keeper is saying to the owner of the vineyard, let me put some fertilizer around it. Let, let me work on it a little bit. And that's what Jesus does. He comes to, into your life, Christian, and he brings people to you. He brings opportunity to you. He brings you to a Bible-believing church to get involved, to sow seed. You know, you cannot grow fruit if you don't sow seed. And the seed doesn't begin to grow until the seed first dies. You must die to your self-desires so that you can do for the kingdom of God so that it can come back to life and bear great evidence, bear great fruit, and meet the needs not only of yours, but of others, and ultimately glorify Jesus. Amen? You following me here? Okay. But if not, Luke 13, 9 says, then cut it down. What do you do with a tree that's no good? We had a... A couple of young men yesterday come to the church and went to the back and cut a, a little tree down that was growing up by the air condition unit. And you know where it's at right now? It's laying right down the ground, dying. In a couple of days, it'll be brown. In a couple more days, it, if I don't pick it up and throw it away, which might happen, <laughs> it'll just wither and just become real fragile and brittle. Then it'll be ready to just be burned up, thrown away, or put in the trash. And Jesus is talking about people. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Only he has the right to say, uh, your time is up. Because he is the one who gave you time. He, he holds all things in the palm of his hand. Your very breath belongs to Christ. He breathed in your father, Adam. We all come from Adam. And when God created Adam... He breathed into his nostrils. He made an image of Adam in the ground, and he breathed into him. And Adam became a living being. That breath has been passed down through every single human being on the face of this earth. And our breath belongs to God, and only God can demand it back. Now, Luke 8, verse 11 says this. Jesus was giving a parable, but he's very clear about the story. He says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The word of God is the seed. What are you doing with the word of God today? It's one thing to read the Bible, but it's another thing to apply it. Now I'm talking about that spiritual seed. It's a spiritual seed. 
One day, Jesus will call every Christian one by one before his throne. Now, please listen. Every Christian will go one by one before the throne of Jesus. Well, man, uh, Michael, that's going to take a long time. No, it's not. Well, Michael, there's billions of Christians that have existed. Yes, I understand that. But a, a day to us is a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years to us is like a day to the Lord. God, the timeline of God, God is not bound by our thinking, by our time, by our understanding of things. God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. He can see all things at all times. He is in all places at all times. You get what I'm saying? So the Lord will be able to meet every individual, every Christian, one by one. Also, the other judgment, the great white throne judgment that Revelation talks about, where every unbeliever will be there to be judged and condemned. You do not want to be at the great white throne judgment. But you do want to be at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, it says this. Paul says, therefore, he's speaking to the believer, to the Christian. Now, please listen. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, meaning whether we're living here or, or not, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, meaning as a Christian, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. Consciences. Now, this is only referring to Christians because we're known by God. God knows us and we know God. This is a special type of judgment. Let, let, let's read a little bit more into what this judgment means because some of you may have heard this for the first time in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5 through 17 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep in line with the judgment see to Christ but I also want to talk about the seed and about how we need to be focused on these things now look what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth the church in Corinth was bringing up a debate saying I like Paul's ministry. Oh, yeah? I like Apollos' ministry. Oh, yeah? Well, I like Peter's ministry. And Paul is writing to them and telling them, are y'all crazy? It's Jesus we keep our eyes on. Watch. He says in verse 5, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, capital D, the day, this is a very special day, the judgment seat of Christ on that day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. That's the Holy Spirit, I believe. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But watch this. But he himself will be saved. This is not a judgment of condemnation, but the judgment seat of Christ. You'll be saved, yet as so through the fire. You'll be saved through the Holy Spirit, though. Verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? Now, Paul is speaking about a judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Paul is saying that he basically laid the foundation through Christ, by the power of Christ, by the wisdom of Christ. 
He laid the foundation for which every Christian now is building. This ministry, the ministry, other Christian ministries throughout the world, throughout the church age, they've, we have all built on this foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And one day, every Christian will stand before Christ and, and they will lay all their works, all the things that they have done as a Christian. And the Holy Spirit will fall upon this work. Because, see, the Holy Spirit is with us even now. The Holy Spirit basically will bear evidence before the throne of Jesus Christ of were our motives right or were our motives wrong? Did we do this with a good heart or with bad intentions? Was this work we did as a Christian honoring to God or did it dishonor God? When did we get it right? When did we get it wrong? Did we repent? Were we found in repentance? That is what the Holy Spirit, he will bear evidence. Because you remember, what does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit in John 15 and 16? It says that he will give what? Witness. The, he the Holy Spirit will bear witness. He will bear witness of all evil things that have happened in the world and also of every single act of every Christian. You really, we really don't understand how deep this message can go. But the Holy Spirit is with you even when you're asleep and you're, in, you're dead in your sleep, it's the Holy Spirit who's still working in you, protecting you, developing you, guiding you. And so that's why it is so important to have a prayer life. It is so important to be in the Scripture. It is so important to have Christian fellowship because the Spirit, He moves through these things. And so when you truly, finally take your walk with Jesus serious, because Jesus has taken uh, His walk with you serious, when you take your walk with Jesus serious then you're going to get somewhere. Doors are going to be open. But if the doors are not being opened in your life right now, it's because you're not walking. Doors only open when you walk. But if you're just in stagnant spiritual water, doors not going to open and the doors are not going to close either. You're just stuck in a rut. Get moving. The Bible says, draw near unto me and I shall draw near unto you, saith the Lord. You got to put your faith to action. You have not because you ask not. Turn off social media. Turn off the games. Turn off all these things and get serious with Jesus. If you plan on staying in heaven with Jesus for eternity, get walking. Why is it so quiet in here? I'm preaching to myself too, guys. And I praise the Lord for what he's doing in my life, in my wife, in our life, in our, in our home. Praise God. He is faithful, even when we were not faithful. He was faithful, and He is faithful. But the Holy Spirit will test this. He will bear witness of this. Now, Paul is saying something. I watered, Apollos sowed. Or I sowed, and Apollos watered. What did we just read in Luke 8, 11? The seed is the Word of God. What you do with the Word of God. When you read the Bible... That's the word of God. But now that spiritual seed is now in your mind. It's now in your heart. And it's got to come out through your mouth. It's got to come out through your hands and feet. It's got to give life. It's got to bring action. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God didn't just say, I love them. God said, I'm going to do something. And God did it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, John 15, verse 8. Jesus says this. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus is saying, you must bear much fruit. You must give much evidence. Give evidence. Action. Look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In the Bible, that is known as the Gospels. But the first book right out of the gate for the church is called the book of Acts. Do you know why it's called the book of Acts? It's because it's the book of action. The acts of the Holy Spirit. The acts of the church. They did something with their faith. They did not just sit in the pew on Sunday morning and did their own thing the rest of the week. They were active. They met daily in prayer. 
They met daily in, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And people were getting saved by the thousands daily. Why do we not see people getting saved thousands daily? Why? Because we're too busy with our own little thing. We're not, we're not about the kingdom of God. We're about the kingdom of this, the kingdom of that. Either he is the Lord of all or he is not the Lord of all. When you get up, your life has to be about the advancement of the kingdom of God. The word, the seed, you have the word and you are able to sow it into the life of others, into other people's minds. You're able to sow the seed either by telling them or by just showing them by the way you live your life. Now, God is glorified when you give much evidence. Now, what also is the fruit? What also is the seed? Again, remember what I said? The seed must die. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me daily. You must die to your self-desire so that you can carry your cross, the testimony that you have of Jesus. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, this seed is the Word of God. And when the seed is in you, you die. But it begins to create a new creation in you. And the evidence in you personally is the fruit of the Spirit. And that is why I've always felt, in my opinion, my understanding, evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is not necessarily that you speak in tongues, though it is an evidence, but the evidence is that you bear these fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When those things are evidently clear in your life and working in your life, it's because the seed has been put in you. And it's because you're allowing the Lord to move and to develop you. Amen. Guess what, guys? You are no longer like that fig tree that Jesus found that had no fruit. And Jesus said, be cursed. Jesus said, be done away. You'll never bear fruit. You'll never meet the need of anyone again. No, because you have these, the fruit of the Spirit in you. God is going to use you. God is not going to develop these things in you just to have you sit on the shelf. God is not going to put his very best in you just to have you sit on the pew. You got to have a desire. Lord, what can I do? Send me, Lord, I'll go. Some of you acted prematurely. You, you went ahead of the Lord in the past and you got eaten up by the, banged in the head by the devil. And you never forgot it. And that's why he said, oh, I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying right here. Come on now. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. Moving along. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. This is not just talking about physical money, though it is. The seed is the word of God. So the seed of the word of God teaches you about what to do with your time, talent, and treasure. When you invest your seed, your seed of time, your seed of talent, and your seed of treasure, when you invest all three, you're going to experience the blessings of God. Not, you don't do this so that you can be blessed. You do this so that you can be a blessing. And again, if you don't have the right motive, God knows it, and you're not going to experience it in the way that he would want you to. So don't fool him, because you can't. You cannot be. There is one who scatters. And instead of yet, it just says, and increases more. See, this person is giving their time, talent, and treasure. They're giving, they're giving. And there is one who withholds more than is right but it leads to poverty. 
Are you in spiritual poverty today? There's a reason if you are. Are your, are your needs not being met? There's a reason if your need is not, is not being met. There's a reason. The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, this is not just talking about money. God does want to bless you financially. He does. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel, okay? But not all will be blessed financially. Look, look at the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I know what it's like to have plenty, and I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like to have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and I know what it's like to have zero dollars. But all in all, I'm still praising God. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have good days, and you're going to have bad days. But when you just sow your seed of time, talent, and treasure, because it is the Word of God, you're going to see life, not only in you, but in others. And remember the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord is going to bring this to account. He's going to say, let's talk about what you did with the word that I gave you. Let's talk about the time that I gave you. Let's talk about your talents that I gave you. And let's talk about the money I gave you, the opportunity I gave you, the anointing I gave you. What did you do when I sent you to that Bible-believing church? Did you stay and grow roots? Or did you get mad because the, a, a, a wind of the devil caught you and you just saw something differently and uprooted you? The Lord is going to bring all that. Some of us are going to have our head down low. But God is going to save you because you've already been saved. And you'll enter into heaven but you won't have much treasure to lay at the feet of Jesus to say how much you truly honored him. And this will show for eternity. Look, guys, people could say, no, I, I don't. Think. Well, listen, there's going to be a great cry in heaven. That's why the Bible says God will wipe away every tear. This is talking about in heaven. He will wipe away every tear. Because if the rich man could die and go to hell and the poor man who died and went to the bosom of Abraham, they could see each other from heaven and hell paradise and hell they could see each other the rich man in hell could see what he missed and the poor man in abraham's bosom could see what he lost what he didn't have to get and so imagine when you are in heaven and you see your loved ones who didn't make it that you're still going to see that for just a brief moment but then god's going to wipe it away and they will be shut out for eternity, never to be seen or heard from again, ever. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, inside the gates are the holy, the righteous, the upright. But outside the gate are the dogs, the sorcerers. What is sorcery? Today, it's known as drug addiction. The liars, the adulterers, the fornicators. This is what God says, not Michael. And we should thank God of what we have been saved from. And sometimes we have failed God. But we get back up and we learn and we do things better. And you know, if you call me your pastor, then praise God. Hallelujah. I, I, this is what I am talking to you about this today. Because God has led me to be a pastor in his church. He, the great shepherd, the great pastor. And I'm just passing along this information to you so that you can do well and that you can have her hear from God, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is why I speak to you about these things. I don't speak to you about these things in judgment because I have my own cross to carry. I have my own appointment at the judgment seat of Christ. And if the Lord will keep me strong, I'm going to walk in there with my head up, unashamed, because that's what Hebrews 4.16 says. Let us come before the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that he is willing to pour out his grace and mercy in our time of need. That is scripture. Hebrews 4.16. We are called to have no shame when we come to the throne of grace, when we come before him. Because we must learn to be transparent, to be honest with, not just with people, but to be honest with the Lord. Because if you can be honest with the Lord, then you can be honest with anybody else. 
God will not just let you pass along like the public school system does. Just pass them along, send them to the next grade. God does not do that. In Ecclesiastes 11.6, it says here, In the morning, sow your seed. In the morning, sow your seed. That's why I said, when you get up in the morning, if you don't feel right, stay in bed. Keep talking to the Lord. Because when you get out of bed, you've got seed to sow. And if your head's all messed up, if your mind's in the wrong place, you're already on the wrong track. Amen? In the morning, the Lord wants you to sow your seed. And in the evening, it says here, do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Meaning, every opportunity, give. I, I, I shared with you the other night, people come to us asking them to, to help them with this, to help them with that, and we do. We do these things. Why? Because that's what the scripture says. You know, I want to sow seed too. Amen? Uh, and so sometimes it does come in the form of lending somebody money, lending, giving somebody a, a, a possession of yours, or talking to them about the, the Lord Jesus Christ, or just every time you're around them, you are an example of Christ to them. It's all the same thing. You're sowing a seed into them. That's all the same thing, guys. So sow seed. Give. Give without expecting repayment. And you never know what is going to prosper. I remember one time somebody lent me some money a long time ago and I couldn't pay them back. And all of a sudden I was able to. And I came to them and they were shocked. Man, I forgot all about that. Man, I could sure use that right now. Amen? Amen. And that's you, Christian. You're just sowing seed. Because you never know when you yourself need to be watered. And you will be. And it's going to come back to you because God meets our needs always. And it's not just about your need being met. Look around. We have to help each other. We have to visit each other. It cannot all just fall on the pastor's shoulders or a couple of people in ministry. Get involved in each other's lives. If it starts in the church and happens in the church, it's going to happen outside of the church. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Paul says, But this I say, he says to the believer, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully that is a principle that will never change on this earth a brother pete longoria used to come to this church years ago he told me one time i had never met a christian who was a faithful tither and found them always in need he told me that he truly believed in the principle of the tithe. And that's not what this message is about. You know that. But, but we believe in that. Well, that's Old Testament. That's the law of Moses. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. The principle is so deep. You know, God wants you to be a cheerful giver. Why? Because God is a cheerful giver. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Do you know what that word only begotten means? You've heard the term, right? But do you know what the word only begotten means? It means from within. God gave his only begotten son, meaning this son, Jesus, came from within God. This is God in the flesh. You hear that baby crying? That baby came from somebody. You know, they, but, but it's not their only begotten this Jesus is the only begotten son of God there is no other son God has no other son God has no other children he doesn't people say all the time well we're all children of God no we are not the book of first John says you are either children of God or children of the devil how do you become a child of God you must be 
adopted into the family of God. How? By his only son, Jesus. So we talked about Friday night. And so if you sow bountifully, you're going to be a man, a woman of God who has great resources. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Look at them. Look at David. Look at Solomon. They were givers. They honored God. Every time God did something, they honored him. They didn't give just so to be recognized. They honored God with with every increase that they got. They honored God. And that's what hurts the church today because that mindset does not exist in the church in regards to your time, talent, and treasure. You know, how many commandments do you have to break to be a lawbreaker? There's 10. How many do you have to break to be a lawbreaker? One. That's right. And the same it is with this principle. I'm telling you, just hear me out. God will not let you slide on this. He wants you to get it all. Honoring him and the time, talent, and treasure. So when you sow seed into the kingdom of God, in all that he has given to you, you begin to get it and you begin to grow and you begin to mature and you begin to go forward. Doors begin to open. You go from where you were in your elementary faith now into a greater faith. And the Lord Jesus says, all you need is just to start with a small mustard of seed. You just need a small measure of faith to begin this journey. But you know what's so sad? A lot of Christians say, well, that's all you need is a mustard seed, a small as faith. They don't even have that because they're stuck always in the same spot. They never grow. They never mature. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because God is a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all-sufficiency in things may have an abundance for every good work. God blesses you, what Scripture just said, God blesses you so that you can do good works. And what are the good works? The evidence, the fruit, the figs. That's the good work. When you do good works, you have figs to give. So is it about the figs? Is it about the figs? How many figs do you have to glorify God with? Lord, I, I, I can do this and I can do this for you, Lord. And, and you're not boasting, but the Bible says, but if you're going to boast, boast in Jesus. Amen? So if we're going to boast, let's boast in the Lord. Understand that it's here today, it's gone the next day, but the Lord, he brings fresh manna every morning. Amen? Galatians 6, verse 6 through 10, last scripture. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches the word. Who teaches. Those who who, who you have learned the word of God from, share with them. And also us as we are sharing with you. Look, look. What am I doing with you? I am sharing something with you. And the Lord is saying, and in return, share something back. We're helping each other. To put money in the pastor's pockets, is that what it's saying? No, that's not what this is saying. You know, when a pastor has a right heart with God, God gives that pastor vision. My people perish for lack of knowledge. And if you don't have vision, the vision of God, you go nowhere. But but leaders in churches have vision. And that's why it's important for leaders to talk together, something we're learning to do now. But they talk to each other. And when we have the seed that is given to us from our brothers and sisters who sit under the ministry, we're able to do more greater things. It's all about the works. Because we're going to give an accounting of our works in the body of Christ one day. Amen? And so by doing this, it results in the salvation of souls. Why? Because we have a a, a small school right now, which the devil has been trying to close since it first opened. We we have a small school that, with the little kids that we have, we're trying to put the word of God into them. And they are. They're growing. They're maturing. Amen? Again, let him who is taught the word in all good things with him who teaches. Share in all good things with him who teaches. Verse 7. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, while sowing your seed, don't get tired. For in due season, that's when in God's business, in God's time, we are to always be in season, but when it says in good season, it means in God's timing. In good season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And that's where a lot of people lose impatience. They lose patience. They lose patience. They lose focus. They lose direction. Because their eyes are on people and not on God. And therefore you're in debt. Physical, spiritual, you're in debt, you're in poverty. Are you tired of being tired? That is what insanity is. Doing the same thing, expecting different results. Verse 9, again, And let us not grow weary while doing good. We are supposed to be doing good. If you're doing bad, you're not going to grow weary of it. People who do bad, they just keep doing it. Because God knows their heart, and he'll give them over to a reprobate mind eventually. It's in one ear, and it's out the other. But God disciplines his sons and daughters. He knows who belongs to him. He knows whose names are truly written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's why he won't let you go. And that's why he's dealing with you right now. And that's why you're sitting here. That's why you're watching online. Because you know that your life may not be right in this situation or in that situation. So get it right. Because he has surrounded you with fertilizer, with opportunity, with the kingdom of heaven to make you grow so that you may honor him in every good work. Verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, you see that? As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It begins with the body of Christ first. I've always said that. If you can love the church, then you can love everyone else. Because we are really brothers and sisters through the blood of Christ. I have sisters because of the blood of a man. But we are brothers and sisters because of the blood of Christ, which is eternal. And God tests our sincerity and our love for him by how we treat each other, how we love each other. You get what I'm saying today? Amen? And so it's about sowing seed. It's not just about the fig tree. It's not just about eating figs and fruit and all. It's about opportunity. Opportunity passes you. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that? Opportunity just passed you by. How many times will that happen to you during the day when you miss that opportunity? I had one the other night. I went to go eat, my wife and I. And I had an opportunity to talk to somebody, and I missed it. And I'm sitting in the car driving home like, Lord, I can't believe I just let that through my fingers. I can't believe that, Lord. My wife don't even know. I'm like, man, I, I, you gave me an opportunity. And I was just so busy about what I had to do the next day. So we're not perfect, guys. But let's, let, let's be mindful of these things. And, and let's be about the work. Sowing seed. It's about, that's what it's about. Amen? Who's been blessed by this message? Amen? Give God praise. Give God praise in this house.